NBA Twitter GMs are the absolute worst. Check out the replies to this tweet. There's a reason that these people are just in the comments and not in an NBA front office. If you want to laugh at some trades, check out the replies. Okay, so it's safe to say that some people were not a huge fan of the replies to the first official 2019-20 NBA trade machine tweet, and that's fine. But as always, if you'd like to have a chance to be in these kinds of videos, then be sure to follow me on Twitter. You can tweet me some trade ideas over there. And as always, basically once a week, I will tweet out asking specifically for trade ideas for a specific player or two. But I actually thought there were some really good trades in these replies, even though there were also some really bad ones, but that kind of stuff is gonna happen because people are going to value and evaluate some players differently, or it might just come down to the fact that they really wanna try and get a certain player on their team, and so they come up with trades that aren't necessarily all that realistic. But even with all that said, let's go ahead and get into some trade ideas for Demonis Sabonis. So first up, at Ar Arningbo, I guess is the best way to say that, has a really interesting Sabonis trade, and he says the Celtics would receive Sabonis in exchange for Grant Williams and Memphis's first round pick this upcoming season. He also adds that the Memphis pick is top six protected this year and unprotected the year after, so it could be a high pick, and maybe Boston would add a little bit more to sweeten the pot in exchange for Sabonis. And this is something that I expected to see when I asked for Demonis Sabonis trades, that being him being traded to Boston, because it's a pretty common thing, but most of the time it involves some kind of swap with Jalen Brown, because they both have to be paid this offseason, the Celtics need a big, the Pacers could potentially need a wing, and so that combination makes sense. And I actually think this is pretty solid value for the Pacers, because they're getting back the Memphis pick rather than Boston's own, so they either get a late lottery pick this year because it's top six protected, or they get Memphis's unprotected pick pick next year. And Sabonis becomes really valuable to a Celtics team that definitely needs help at the four and five spots, and they only have to give up a player that's going to be a rotation big as a rookie in Williams, and a pick of which they have a million similar players on their roster in terms of guys that have been picked in the first round. They just had three in this past draft, so that Memphis pick, although it's valuable, might make sense for them to flip that to get a player of Sabonis's caliber. But I do have issues with this on both sides. For the Pacers, I'm not sure that this is enough value, even considering the potential value of that Memphis pick. And this is also a kind of move that you make when you're kind of planning for next season. So really this only would make sense for them if their season doesn't really get off to a great start and they wanna try and move on and get value out of Sabonis before having to pay him this off season because in terms of this year, this would certainly make them worse. Grant Williams is not as good of a player as Sabonis, or at least I would be very surprised if he is as good as him initially. And then you get the pick as well. So for Indiana, it's a little bit more of a forward thinking move, which it could be a little strange considering this is a team that could challenge for a four and five seed in the Eastern Conference this season. And then my issue for the Celtics is that they're going to have to worry about paying both Sabonis and Brown this offseason. Even though they're both restricted, which is nice, both these guys are going to demand pretty high value contracts, and that's something that the Celtics are going to have to juggle. They're already going through negotiations with Jalen Brown at the moment, and so then when you add on having to pay Sabonis as well, that could be a lot, which I think is why a lot of people just kind of assume that if this did happen, it would involve a Brown for Sabonis swap in, in some kind of uh, of way but again I, I just I think it's going to be a bit of an issue for them to pay both of them even though it would make them better this season and I personally would love to see Sabonis in Boston I want him to get away from Indiana I really want to get a feel for how good he actually is as a starting caliber big rather than coming off the bench and being a kind of this weird combination uh, with Miles Turner in the front court so I'd like to see this I just I do have issues on both sides even though I think it is a good trade initially moving on now Kyrie Swerving has a trade that involves McDermott and Sabonis going to the Denver for Nuggets in exchange for Michael Porter Jr., Jeremy Grant, and the Nuggets 2022 first round pick. And for me, for the Pacers, this is pretty good value. We know the potential Michael Porter Jr. Grant is a solid player on a good deal, and they get a pick on top of it. It's a little bit tough that they have to give up someone like McDermott, who's going to be a rotation player for them, but they do get back Michael Porter Jr., who could potentially be something for them. Again, I like Grant's value, his versatility, the fact that he's on a pretty good deal over the next couple of years, and then you get the pick as well. My issue here is with the Denver Nuggets, because personally, I'd like to at least see what Michael Porter Jr. is going to be on the court before I just start trading him away. If I'm Denver, I at least want to have him play for me first and then maybe look at trading him potentially. And if I am going to move him, I don't think it's going to be in a package for someone like Damana Sabonis. And on top of that, I've already talked about how much I really like the Grant addition for this team in terms of versatility, in terms of him being able to do different things matchup wise for them, specifically in the postseason. And then on top of that, Sabonis has already said that he's kind of disappointed and 
and over having to come off the bench for the Pacers. And if he went to Denver, he'd probably have to come off the bench for them as well with Paul Millsap being in the four, obviously Jokic being at the five. And then their front court rotation would be very good with Millsap and Sabonis and, and Jokic and Plumlee, obviously. But he'd always have to be on the floor with another traditional big, or at least most of the time he would, which puts him in a very similar situation to where he was in Indiana. They also have to worry about re-signing him, which could potentially be an issue. And I'm just not really sure, honestly, that this makes them all that much better. I mean, I, I like Sabonis, but again, I like the versatility that Jeremy Grant provides as a four and five. I'd like to see Michael Porter Jr. a little bit more. And then giving up a pick this far to the future in 2022, even for a team as deep and as young and as talented as the Nuggets, makes me a little bit nervous as well. So if I'm the Nuggets, I'm saying no to this. If I'm the Pacers, I would probably say yes. So it kind of makes sense, but it just kind of depends on your evaluation of a couple of different players in this deal. And then last up now in the Sabonis trades, Ralphie said that the Hawks would get Sabonis in exchange for Cam Reddish, Alex Lynn, the Nets first round pick, as well as a second round pick. And this one caught my eye and I kind of went a lot of different ways with it in my head. And I think in a weird kind of way, it makes sense for both teams. Sabonis fits well at the five in Atlanta, assuming that they're willing to pay him, and I could see them fitting together Collins and Sabonis in an interesting, versatile front court. The Pacers get a wing back in Reddish that is just now starting his rookie deal, so they don't have to pay him like they would Sabonis, plus Len to replace Sabonis in the rotation for this season, and a first that will likely be between 17 to 23 in the draft this upcoming season. My issue with this is similar to the first trade for the Pacers, because this is really only a move that they make if one, they think Cam Reddish is going to be good to start and someone that's going to be good for them right away, or two, just like I talked about in the first one, maybe their season doesn't get off to a great start and they're looking to plan more for the future, because that's really more what this deal is about. Reddish is more of a project player at this point, and then you get the picks as well in exchange for someone in Sabonis that you would have to pay to keep this off season and really isn't all that happy in his current role. And so maybe around on the trade deadline this makes a little bit more sense for both of these teams depending on where they're at in the standings my other issue is for atlanta like they've traded away players in the past most specifically off the top of my head i'm thinking about tory and prince they traded away guys like that because they just didn't want to pay them so far ahead of schedule of some of the other younger players that they have on the roster and i feel like they would be wary to pay the bonus as well not knowing how well he would fit with Collins in the front court when they've shown an interest in trading away players that they would have to pay prior to Collins and Young and then the two guys they just drafted as well. So even though I think this is interesting, I'm not convinced that either team would really say yes to this. And now we move on to another player. If you've never watched one of these trade machine videos before, I take some of you all suggestions for a player and then I come up with some of my own as well for different players. And we're going to move on to some Andre Iguodala trades now. The first trade I came up with is Iguodala going to the Grizzlies in exchange for Jerome Robinson and Maurice Harkless. And for me, this is a logical Iguodala destination is the LA Clippers. They have a need for a good wing. They have an expiring contract in Harkless and a young player that could be good for Memphis in Robinson. And even though the Grizzlies have held on to Iguodala this entire time, I don't think it's going to take a ton for them to trade him. I just think that they recognize that he has value and they're not just going to buy him out for nothing, especially in a season in which a lot of these teams are going to be looking to make moves at the deadline or before it to increase their chances of pushing for the conference finals or potentially a championship and what should be a relatively wide open championship chase. And they're smart for doing that. Anytime you have a player that has value like Iguodala does, it makes sense for a team like Memphis that needs to stockpile as much talent as possible to try and get value out of him. So this completely makes sense for me for Memphis. And I think Robinson is a player that could interest them in addition to the expiring contract of Harkless. And then for the Clippers, the reason that this makes sense is pretty obvious. Like I said, they need a good wing. Iguodala is someone with championship experience. If this is a team that has real aspirations and looks like a real championship team by about mid-season by the trade deadline, this is a move that certainly makes sense. The only reason I could see this not working out for either team is if the Clippers are really high on Robinson for some reason, or if Memphis has better offers on the table for Iguodala that potentially involve some picks because the Clippers don't have any picks for the next like 20 years or so to end up trading away in a move like this. But on paper, assuming the other offers aren't better than this, I think this makes sense for both sides. And then last up, I have a trade where Andre Iguodala ends up with the Dallas Mavericks in exchange for Justin Jackson, Dorian Finney-Smith, and the expiring contract 
of Courtney Lee. And to be completely honest with you, this might not be great value for Andre Iguodala because even though like Justin Jackson and Finney Smith could be good assets, Finney Smith is signed long term. I think he's someone that can be good defensively, can make some shots. Justin Jackson has shown some signs of being a good shooter, former first round pick. And then you obviously have the expiring contract of Courtney Lee. If it was up to me, I would definitely take the Clippers offer if both of these were on the table. But assuming that maybe there aren't some better ones on the table, this could be a good one. The Mavs could throw in like a second round pick or two if that would really entice the Grizzly enough to make this work. But this is more just assuming that there aren't a ton of really good trade offers out there for Andre Iguodala and the Grizzlies are just kind of settling for a deal like this. This would obviously really help the Mavericks getting them another good wing, very similar to the Clippers situation in terms of needing a guy with championship experience. Even though I'm not convinced that they're going to be in the same situation where they're going to be pushing to be really, really good this year, which is what this kind of move signals. I still think it'd be nice for them to have Iguodala on the roster, especially considering that they're really not giving up that much here. Now, having said that, if you guys have any other trade machine ideas for either of these players, whether it be Iguodala, whether it be uh, Demonis Demonis, whether it be any player across the NBA, like I said in the beginning, the best way to get a hold of me, the best way to potentially get yourself in one of these videos is to send me a tweet with a trade idea or just wait until I tweet out asking for trades for a specific player. I just go through those kinds of things when I'm going through these community suggestions part of this. The other thing that I would mention is just to try and be try and be realistic as possible with these. Like, don't just say, oh, I really want this guy to end up on this team and try and finagle a trade. Try and be as realistic as possible because really only good ones are going to make the videos here, at least trades that I think are good. And that's one of the most difficult parts about this is just trying to evaluate what other people are seeing in other players because some people think that this guy's really good and some people think that this guy's really awful and that can kind of skew opinions on trades. But that's why I love doing this series because the opinions are so varied because it creates so much conversation and I, I just really enjoy looking through and kind of seeing where you guys are coming from and then obviously making up my own trades as well as something I do in my free time anyway. So I might as well put them into a video. But that is going to be the end of today's video and I thank you all very much for watching. Once again, my name is Tucker. If you missed any of my previous videos, then be sure to check out the boxes on screen. Thanks again, and I'll see you all next time.